Hey guys, Scott Short here with Empire Home Loan Corporation. My NLS number is 225-998. My California DRE license is 0107-4493, long number. Go ahead, go. And I am Jamie Furlong, managing partner with Legacy Investment Real Estate. Boom, here we go. So Jamie is a great friend of ours. She's actually did, she's, I met her in an elevator old office, so it's kind of cool thing people in the elevator, so it's, it's cool that she let me talk to her. It's like, get away with those kids. <laughs> But we're talking today about a thing called the Delaware Statutory Trust. That's what she does. So break it down. What is the Delaware Statutory Trust and why somebody should care? I'd be happy to. Um, and, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to chat about this because, uh, you know, Scott and I both work in the world of real estate. Um, and yet the solutions I provide are quite niche um, and relatively unknown to a lot of real estate professionals. And so I appreciate the opportunity and what Scott and I both love to do is to make sure real estate professionals and real estate investors understand all of their options when they're making their real estate investment plans. So what I seek to help people with is navigating 1031 exchanges. What's that? A 1031 exchange is a part of the IRS tax code that allows someone who owns investment real estate, so not a primary residence, but investment property, um, when they sell that property, typically it's appreciated, which would trigger a capital gain, which is taxable. But the 1031 exchange tax code, if you follow the rules, allows you to defer that capital gain if you reinvest the proceeds into another investment property. So that's where my conversation usually starts with clients. They already own investment property and they are wondering if that investment property is still the best investment for them at that point in their life. A lot of time these conversations happen with their realtor. So a realtor might say to that investor, well you can keep the property you own or you can sell it and if you sell it you might have a significant tax liability or you can do a 1031 exchange and as a realtor they might start talking to you about more um, property types similar to what you currently own like another single family rental home what isn't a part of that conversation often is the Delaware Statutory Trust. So what I like to do is I like to join that conversation with the investor, with the realtor, with the advisory team and say, in addition to keeping the home, selling it, or exchanging into another rental home, there is another option called a Delaware Statutory Trust. And I haven't yet told you exactly what the Delaware Statutory Trust is. Thank you. Trust is. I was going to ask a question. So good. You read my mind. Um, Go ahead. It's essentially an IRS recognized replacement property or investment available to accredited investors who Ooh, are. What's a accredited investor? Good, good question. Thank you. Um, an accredited investor is um, either an individual who's. Annual income is $200,000 and expected to continue to be that, or if you fall jointly, $300,000 of income, or net worth outside of your primary residence of a million dollars, either single or jointly if you file jointly. So not everybody's going to qualify as an accredited investor, um, which is one um, criteria for something like Delaware Statutory Trust Investment. There's also some other suitability requirements, and that's a big part of my job is determining if someone might be suitable for this. Um, but the concept is um, a Delaware Statutory Trust is recognized by the IRS as like kind for the purposes of a 1031 exchange. The key benefits are that it is totally passive to the investor. What's that mean? The investor does nothing. Good, thank you. All daily <laughs> and annual and ongoing management and responsibility and decisions are handled by a third party sponsor company. So Scott, have you ever heard somebody complain about being a landlord? Oh yeah, the, the three T's, right? Yeah. Tennis, trash, and toilets. Yes. That <laughs> right, and, and we live in California. Yep. Um, so in addition to the everyday difficulties of, of owning investment properties, like dealing with tenants yep. and maintenance, um, there's also a lot of regulatory issues yep. in California. Lots of people um, struggled during COVID with um, eviction moratoriums and that sort of thing. So in our world, we meet people who say, it would be wonderful if I could get out of this labor and capital intensive 
management and an investment property I own, but what solution is available that excludes me from having to continue to be a landlord and a manager. So that is the primary appeal of a Delaware statutory trust. The investor does not have to deal with any of the property level um, issues. Or, or the problem is, tell about the timeline. If you don't, if you get me the timeline, what happens? Yeah. So um, <laughs> if any of you have been in a 1031 exchange before, you know that the IRS has um, imposed pretty strict timelines for completing your exchange. The most restrictive timeline would be most people have only 45 days from the time they close escrow on the property they're selling to identify what they plan to buy. Um, and there's some rules on what that identification form and list can look like, um, but it can be really hard in just 45 days to find a property that you like, do your due diligence on it, write an offer, get an offer accepted, especially over the past couple of years, that, you know, crazy, crazy market. Um, the, the Delaware Statutory Trust uh, exists, there's a, there's a perpetual, or there's usually a perpetual inventory of Delaware Statutory Trust properties. So what I love to see is when the real estate investor starts on their plan early and gets introduced to the Delaware Statutory Trust early so that they can keep it in mind, if they're suitable and an accredited investor, they can keep it in mind as a backup. So what that might look like is they work with their realtor and they go around town and they look at properties, but if they don't find something they like, they could potentially pivot to something like the Delaware Statutory Trust with just a few days left on their identification <laughs> timeline. So, so just to set up. So, when they talk to you, you know, how many days when they come into screaming in? They didn't what they told you to do it first. Was talking to you beforehand. They come screaming in. How many days last minute you need to, to deal with somebody? So. Um, <laughs> I never want to see anybody make a rushed decision. I think that could lead to bad decisions. Yep. And, you know, in this conversation, we've talked a lot about suitability. Yep. The Delaware Statutory Trust is a complex investment with a lot of potential um, benefits and a lot of risks. And it is critical that the investor have a series of conversations with me to understand the potential benefits and the risks. Can we expedite those conversations if my schedule allows for it? Yes. Um, I have had some last minute calls from lawyers and CPAs um, whose clients need need this guidance. Um, so, so long if you want to consider a Delaware Statutory Trust as a backup option for your exchange, it must be included on your ID form within the 45 days. You cannot call me on day 46. <laughs> Is it possible to have the conversations we need to have on day 45? It's possible, but I hope this video reaches more people <laughs> so that they call me months in advance right. of their exchange or weeks in advance of their exchange and not at the last minute. That's always my preference. So when you, so what happens? So they come to you and say, I want to do a Delaware Statutory Trust. How do you, it's going to come walk through this conversation with somebody, let's say somebody's, you know, right before they retire, someone's retired, it seems like that's kind of your, your, almost your book. Or right, give me an example of that. Yeah, so you're referring to what does a typical DST investor yep. maybe look yep. like and yep. then what's the process? Yep. Um, Thank you. Very rarely <laughs> does someone call me and say, I want to do a DST investment. More commonly, someone is referred to me by another professional, their realtor, their lawyer, their CPA, for example, and they say, hey, this person who I, who I like knows my story and they think I might be interested in a Delaware statutory trust, but I have never heard of it. Jamie, what is this? So most people are coming to me not even knowing what a Delaware statutory trust is. So there's a lot of fundamentals to cover, but the way we approach our clients is helping them achieve their goals. What are your goals? What are your income needs? What are your liquidity needs? What do the rest of your investments look like? Can a DST 
help you meet your goals? Is it a better solution than what you currently own? And are you comfortable with all of the risks? So there are a series of conversations we will have with prospects to make sure they understand what this investment is and make sure we understand their goals. Um, if it's a right fit, eventually we move to the point where our team makes recommendations for them. Within the inventory of available properties, we would begin to make recommendations that we think will help them achieve their goals and at the right risk level for them. Um, many of our clients are able to complete their 1031 exchange well in advance of the 45 day deadline because we can do a lot of planning in advance. Um, a lot of our clients, we mentioned this a minute ago, people reach a point where they're tired of being a landlord. Yep. That's usually later in life, maybe in retirement, they want to travel more, for example. Um, so a lot of our clients and a lot of DST investors are older and their investment objectives have shifted a little bit. It's less about growth, it's more about capital preservation and uh, predictable income. Usually they're living on fixed income because they're retired. And so we do see a lot of the DST inventory um, property types sort of cater to that demographic, although there are other property types um, and kind of risk profiles that we can serve also. So, so let's say if somebody's an older person and they, they, they have the DST, right, they pass away, is that um, ownership in that, is that passive or how's that work? Yeah, so we always have to be mindful of current tax and, and estate planning laws, but currently um, it is, for many of my clients, a very simple asset to pass on because it's your investment is in real property, but management has happened taken care of by a third party. So what the individual investor is really dealing with is, is paper. Right. And so I've, I've had, unfortunately, several clients who passed away, and what happens is, is their financial advisor or their state planning lawyer calls me. We get a copy of the death certificate. We look at the, um, you know, their their state plan. A lot of my clients make their investment via a family trust. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so um, we, but they could also invest as an individual or husband and wife or spouses. Um, but we follow the trust. In in a lot of cases, there's beneficiaries, usually multiple. Right. So this is what's. Convenient. Yeah. Well, actually, nope. the DST is oh, super good. Okay, convenient. go ahead. Fire, fire. Um, like if you have three beneficiaries yep. and you're splitting your assets three ways, we simply work with the DST sponsor to re register the ownership yep. out of the trust and separately into the names of the three beneficiaries. Okay. So, again, this is a totally divisible fractional ownership can divide your real estate asset nice. into three nice. and each beneficiary will end up with their own ownership Good. and totally separate from the others. So for estate planning purposes, we've found that our clients, th the surviving beneficiaries, appreciate the simplicity of this ownership structure over inheriting, say, a portfolio of mom and dad's 20 single-family <laughs> rental homes across yep. Sacramento, yep. and now they're trying to figure out who's going to manage it and what they're going to sell and when and financing and all of that. So I'm throwing a finger at you. So let's mm -hmm. say, like we're, talking, let's, we're using our example of three, three beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Let's say if one of them doesn't want, any, want it, they want it out, they want their money now, now. How does that play out? These investments are um, illiquid. Okay. There's no secondary market. Word, Ill, Ill liquid, not liquid. Ill liquid. Ill liquid. Yeah, not liquid. Um, <laughs> there is no secondary market. So what the beneficiaries need to be comfortable yep. with, and we talked to the, the original investor about this, is when the passing happens and they inherit this, they're going to remain owners yep. for the rest of that investment period, which is an un indeterminate period of time. There are some historical averages as far as how long DSTs are traditionally owned, but it's, it really can't be known. So the beneficiaries need to understand and, and we need to communicate with them in advance that it's an illiquid investment right. and they cannot sell early. They're waiting for that property, for that investment to sell. Okay. At which point in time we do expect, because in a lot of cases, um, 
when they receive that ownership, when they inherit that ownership, there are oftentimes a step up in basis, yep. which is another way of saying the taxes. Talk to your tax person. Yeah. yeah <laughs> talk to your, definitely talk to your tax person. But um, oftentimes the children or the beneficiaries don't have the tax liability that the original investor has. So when that DST property does sell, they can walk away with the cash sure. without potentially a, a large tax sure. bill. So would it be possible, we're not tax bill, let's talk to your tax person, but let's say it's possible, let's say it's like back to the three people, one person is not wanted, let's say the other two parties buy him out, and they, those two people go, is that feasible or is that getting kind of cooper? They don't even need to buy each other out because when they inherit it, they get their own ownership right. and they can make decisions on their own. Right. Let's say there's a sale of that DST property and two of the kids want to pull their money together and yep. make a joint investment. Okay. They should be able to do that separate from me because when that DST property sells, yep. there usually are some cash proceeds. Right. They can check a box that says, we're going to do a 1031 exchange, okay. send the money to a qualified intermediary, or they can say, send us the cash, okay. and then brother and sister can say, hey, we both just got a big lump of money. Let's right. go let's go buy something together. Right. Um, it's really Which flexible. is smarter to make sure you use the tax law as best they can, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and, and like you keep saying, when you're making these decisions, get as much perspective as possible. Your tax preparer, your financial advisor, your broker, your realtor, your lender, your cousins, yep, yep. me. Just not Uncle you. Billy. Uncle Billy don't know nothing. He's like, I don't know. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you might not want, you might not appreciate everybody's advice. Right. Um, so let's say this. So let, when somebody calls you, you know, they come meet you face to face. You zoom on people. I mean, you get everything, right? You kind of open to all different avenues. I am. Oh, cool. um, I, we both live and work in Sacramento, um, it's, but in, in the world of 1031 exchanges, I can, um, you know, it's possible to work with exchangers all over the country. I do have clients outside of the state of California, and so if it's a virtual meeting, great. If it's in person, that's great too. So now, your investments that you have, do you have anything outside the outside United States or is it all inside the United States? Um, the 1031 exchange tax code uh, does require that the property you're selling and the property you're buying be within Good. U.S. territories. Good. So because most of my clients are selling property in the U.S., mm -hmm. the, the inventory of DST properties I have are in the United States. Cool, okay. And the yeah. next question is going to be, so you have kind of a, a wide menu of different things you invest in. So can you break it down like you have apartment complex and houses? What do you guys have? Yeah. Um, so you're right, there is a menu of sorts. So just like if you were working with a realtor to show you homes to buy and, and they drive around and show you what's available, and with me, I can always show you the menu of what's available. And what you'll notice when you look at this menu, um, you'll, you'll notice that it really, it really represents, it's gonna change over time, and it represents or seeks to represent what are, what are the appropriate opportunities in the current market and current cycle? Um, and as time changes and we get into different cycles, you might see different trends in this inventory. Um, but generally speaking, any investment property might be available. Industrial properties, um, essential retail, medical, wow. apartments, self-storage, student housing, even mineral rights. Can you buy a doctor practice? Can you do a doctor's practice? You can 1031 exchange into a um, real property, the, the a building. building. Yeah, gotcha. You cannot 1031 exchange practice, into practice. a business. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool. Thank you, thank you. And talk to your tax person. <laughs> um, so the inventory can, can really cover a lot of bases right. um, as far as different property types and geographies. So this gives an investor who maybe typically was restricted or looked just in their home market, right. like Sacramento, this gives them access um, and opportunities all over the country. And for the first time ever, in a lot of cases, it gives them the opportunity to buy into property types that they couldn't right. access or afford on their own. They could potentially become a fractional owner yeah. of a 300 unit student um, housing okay. property or an Amazon warehouse. There you go, okay. And this allows people to diversify their proceeds if they want. There's some benefits um, to diversifying. There's also some kind of balancing. Yeah. So she can actually have a lot of money. So got this, let's say, let's say you have half a million dollars, right? So I can put some money here in this apartment complex, some money in the Amazon place. So I can, I can kind of play cards with it, right? Or Monopoly. You can. Okay. And right. that's that's part of the conversations cool. we have are determining if, if that's what we want to do. We 
you want to diversify your money or maybe keep it in one one piece and one property. Okay. So last question, I don't want to take too much time. I know you've got, you got a meeting pretty soon. What is the weirdest thing you've invested in? The weirdest thing I've invested in? Um, yeah. I, <laughs> it's a singer. It's a singer. I, I perhaps haven't um, done the weirdest thing right. um, yet, but I do personally take advantage of the opportunity to be a passive investor in properties all over the country, um, actually even all over the world. So what, you know, the world our, our parents grew up in where you could, you know, you save up some cash and you buy a rental home and you rent it out and now you bought it for $75,000 and now it's worth $4 million. Um, that's not the world we live in anymore. There are a lot of benefits to investing in real estate, um, especially as an alternative to like the stock market, <laughs> but it can be hard for the everyday person to access that. And so the world that I work in and what we offer at Legacy Investment Real Estate is you know, for accredited investors who are suitable, the opportunity to invest in real estate without having to do anything. Mm -hmm. So I've invested in student housing, okay. um, oil and gas, okay. um, That's really cool. storage. Um, and Amazon it'll... Warehouse? No. no Amazon Warehouse? No, yeah, not, no, yet, not, not yet, not yet, yet. not yet. But, but I'm, always, you know, I'm always looking for an opportunity. Right. Um, right. Whatever, whatever makes sense for me at that time okay. in the market, at that time, I'll, I'll be open-minded too. I like it. So how do people get a hold of you? Uh, please call our office at area code 916-908-1031. Wow. And again, I'm Jamie with Legacy Investment Real Estate, and I welcome the opportunity to tell you more about the world of Delaware statutory trusts and passive real estate investing. And she's very nice. And she probably yelled at me to be my daughter, so we'll, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> no, so, so thank you guys. We're here at Dan Dantarell's uh, restaurant here. So please, you know, visit our and support our local businesses. We appreciate it, you guys. So thank you again. You're welcome. I appreciate thank you, you Scott. A long time ago. Yeah. Well, there we go. Thank yeah. you guys. Have a great day.